I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you tonight. I do want to start by saying to you it is with the deepest gratitude that I acknowledge my wife and my family that are here tonight, my children Jerry and Amy who both graduated from Eastern, uh, my stepchildren Maya and John, and all my in-laws. You have added to my life in ways that I can't even begin to thank you. To my colleagues in C CMTA, your support and caring me have carried me uh, through so much. I know how lucky I am to have spent a career with people who support and care about each other so much. To my friends from throughout the university, you have made my life so rich and so rewarding in so many ways. To my friends who have shared thoughts, tears, joys, and disappointments, thank you for the many lessons of life that I've learned from you. Finally, I want to thank the parade of students from EMU who have been a lot part of my life for over 40 years. I've learned so much from you, from your insights, your questions, your desire to make the world a better place. I often begin my classes with a thought for the day, as many of my students will tell you. It's usually my two or three or four minutes time to simply talk about what is on my mind and things that I would like my students uh, to have to carry with them the rest of the day. And I'm going to start my last lecture for this uh, program in the same way, by sharing with you a poem from Robert Service. It is a poem that I learned when I was much younger, but I've always loved it. I call it a folk poem. Uh, Robert Service wrote in the far north and wrote things like the cremation of Sam McGee, but in this particular poem, Robert Service wrote this. When, I, when you're lost in the wild and you're scared as a child and death looks you bang in the eye, when you're sore as a boil, it's according to Hoyle to cock your revolver and die. But the code of a man says, fight all you can. And self-dissolution is barred. And hunger and woe, ah, it's easy to blow. It's the hell, sir, for breakfast. It's hard. You're sick of the game. Well, now that's a shame. You're young and you're brave and you're bright. You had a raw deal? I know, but don't squeal. Buck up. Do your damnedest and fight. It's the plug and away that will win you the day. So don't be a piker, old pard. Just draw on your grit. It's so easy to quit. It's the keeping on living that's hard. It's easy to cry that you're beaten and die. It's easy to crawfish and crawl. But to hope to fight and to fight when hope's out of sight, why, that's the best game of them all. And though you come out of each grueling bout all broken and beaten and scarred, just have one more try. It's dead easy to die. It's the keeping on going that's hard. I was honored when I received an invitation to do this lecture as if it was what I would want to say in my last lecture. It gave me an opportunity to ponder my life on this university campus. When I read, when I watch movies, when I pay attention to the news, I am always thinking about my students and the things that I can share with them. Of the 70 years of my life, over 50 have been spent in a university as a student, as a researcher, as a professor. It is almost impossible for me to imagine a life that doesn't involve being part of a university. Learning and being with students has made my life so much richer and better than I could have ever imagined when I was a university freshman. In one of his lesser known poems, Robert Frost wrote, when I was young, my teachers were the old. I gave up fire for form till I was cold. I suffered like a metal being cast. I went to school to age, to learn the past. Now I'm old. My teachers are the young. What can't be molded must be cracked and sprung. I strain at lessons fit to start a suture. I go to school to you to learn the future. I acknowledge 
and thank all my students for all they have done to keep me energized and excited about the world that was, is, and will be as you take over. A couple of weeks ago, I received the evaluation forms that students did regarding my effectiveness as a professor during the fall 2008 semester. I always go through the evaluations, and when there are suggestions for change, I take them very seriously. As I went through those evaluations, I came to an evaluation on which a student had written, I believe Doc Evans is a great teacher, but don't you love the word but? It's, it's a word that I hear lots of times. That's a nice outfit you have on, but. Or, I know you studied hard for that exam, but. That's a good paper that you've written, but. And then you get the real message. There's usually a bit of a kick in the butt. Maybe that's what we mean when we say kicked in the butt. So the student's comment was, Doc Evans is a great teacher, but he's very old. <laughs> he can't hear, and he forgets regularly. I thought a lot about that. The part about not hearing well surprised me. I've been aware for a long time that my wife Katie speaks more and more quietly in the house, but she seemed to me to have hearing problems too. So I decided that I would check to see if it was me or her. So I, in the living room I said, Katie, what are we having for dinner tonight? And she didn't respond. And so I got a little closer and I said, Katie, can you tell me what we're having for dinner tonight? And again, nothing. Finally, I got up very close to her and I said, Katie, what are we having for dinner tonight? And she said, for the third time, I said, chicken. Regarding my memory, what was it I said the student said? Regarding, I remember, Doc Evans regularly forgets. I, I admit, I do get a bit confused sometimes. A while ago, I was telling Katie about a really strange thing that happened to me. I, I got up to go to the bathroom during the night, and when I opened the bathroom door, the light came on, and I didn't even touch it. When I told her, she said, oh, no, Gary, you peed in the refrigerator again. <laughs> to, I, to be honest, I find it easy to identify with a story I heard about a man who was explaining to his friend that he had gone to a memory doctor because both he and his wife were having a lot of difficulty remembering things. And so he, as he told his friend, his friend thought, you know, that wouldn't be bad. I think maybe my wife and I should do that too. So he said, could, could you give me the name of the memory doctor that you go to so my wife and I can go? And the man said, yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, um, oh boy. You know, it's, it's red and it, it has a stem. There are thorns in it and um, uh, uh, people get it when they're in love. He said, Rose. That's it. Rose, what's the name of that memory doctor we're going to? <laughs> it was Shakespeare who wrote all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and each man in his time plays many parts. Shakespeare talked about the stages of life differently than I would. Unlike Shakespeare's analysis, I think more of the stages of my life in this way. Stage one, I believed in Santa Claus. Stage two, I didn't believe in Santa Claus.